Good morning, brothers and sisters, and happy Sabbath. As we are able to rest from our labors today, and as we come before our Heavenly Father, shall we examine that which he has presented for us <clears throat> so that we may more clearly understand our position at this time in earth's history. May our hearts be ready. May they be open. <clears throat> may we be able to come before him in reverence, in praise, so that we may receive the blessings that he would provide for us on this Sabbath. Shall we now seek him in prayer? Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for all that has transpired through the week that is now past. We thank you for this time of rest. We thank you that we may assemble together using this technology <clears throat> to be able to come before you, to worship you in spirit and in truth. May our hearts be ready to receive that which you would present for us. Help us now, guide us in all that you would have us to do. May your will be done throughout this time together. Help us now, Father. Please guide us. For this we thank you, for this we praise you, and this we ask. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. Do you remember the comment that we made at the end of last week's meeting? What, what have we been looking at here with Zechariah 5? And what are we going to be looking at today? What did we determine the flying role was? Well, it's the law of God. And okay. it's that, that by which people are judged. Correct. Okay. Here in letter 142 of 1899, this great role, 20 cubits in length and 10 cubits in breadth, was the measurement of the porch of Solomon's temple. In this role is written the name of the wrongdoer unless he repents of his wrong. The Lord's eye is upon every transaction, and his judgment will come upon those who do wrong. The ninth chapter of Ezekiel should be studied in connection with Ezekiel 2, 1 to 10, and the fifth chapter of Revelation. Now, do we want our names to be on this flying roll? On the flying roll, which has the names of every wrongdoer? Yes. Unless he repents of his wrong? Well, right. no. Brothers and sisters, do you agree with that? I mean, every, everyone's name is written on that roll at some time or other. Right. But it has to, we want it to be removed. We don't want it to remain. So this is what, this is not what the Millerites would have been stating for may your name remain. Right? That's the book of life. That's correct. Is this the book of life? Hmm. Now, the challenge that I asked last week at the close of the meeting, I asked this question. <clears throat> was Ellen White a prophet? Do you accept Ellen White as a prophet? Yes, I do. Okay. Can you prove that Ellen White was a prophet just from the Bible? Well, it depends what you mean. Obviously, we, we have to know stuff about Ellen White. I mean, that's that's what we've we've used yeah so you use the bible to show that she's a prophet okay now I mean, you I, know I, a prophet, and you know a prophet has to arise at that time from from the scriptures and she's the only one who fits the qualifications okay well, you, can, you can also prove it by by the um prophets themselves in other words john like john the baptist he was a um connecting link right he was okay well, one comment in the chat I think is is excellent. One comment makes me smile. I see I see one in the chat that says um, as a as a comment when I'm asking was Ellen White a prophet, and um, one typed T E S. I, I I never thought of Tess as a prophet to be honest. I and think. I know <laughs> I, I know that this is just fast fingers, so I'm just smiling. But Revelation 3.18, when we're comparing this with 8.1.3, Revelation 3.18 has 
Mrs. White's name in it. We're going to get into this in just a moment. And yes, I agree. Church was to have the spirit of prophecy in the last days. Why doesn't the church have the spirit of prophecy? I mean, when Ellen White was laid to rest, shouldn't another prophet have been raised up? And yes, I agree. Another prophet was not raised up because they had rejected the spirit of prophecy. So now <clears throat> I'm going to I'm going to go to a quick study. We're going to look at this. We're going to take this a step at a, a step and a point at a time. All right. So, OK, is a is a different document now in front of you? Yeah. OK. Now, the question here that we're going to ask is. Is Ellen White a prophet? Can this be shown to the scripture? Now, here we're going to look at the prophet's name. We're going to be very specific, especially for the time in which we are living. So Ellen Gould, maiden name Harmon White, who lived from the 26th day of the 11th month of 1827 to the 16th day of the 7th month of 1915, was named Ellen, which from the Greek means torch or shining light. Gould is the old English for gold. Harmon is the old German for soldier. White is self-explanatory and comes from the Middle English. So now we're going to be using both Strong's Concordance, the numbers of Strong's Concordance, and the King James Bible. So let's consider this. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice, and open the door, I will come to him, and will sup with him, and he with me. Why is this important for us? Why is this verse important for us at this time? It shows us that we have to respond to the call of Christ and let him let him come into our lives. Okay. Any other thoughts? This verse in Revelation is given to who? What church is this given to? Well, it's given to to the final church, but it's for all of us throughout time. It's noted as part of the warning to the seventh church, right? To Laodicea. Why is this important? I mean, let's be direct. These words are spoken by Christ. Yet in the book of Revelation, at the very first of the book, we have a very specific pattern that is followed. How does prophecy come to a prophet? What does Revelation 1 outline for us? When we look at Revelation 1, we are being told, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him. So God has given this revelation to the Son to show unto his servants the things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant, John. So all of this comes from God to Christ, to Gabriel, to the prophet. Is that correct? Can you agree with that? Yes. Okay. Now, it is because of a different book that this portion of, of scripture is very important. When we look at this book that has been called Canticles, Solomon's Song, Song of Songs, Song of Solomon, we find that this one book was deemed quite erotic, and that there were many that did not wish it to remain within the canon of Scripture. Martin Luther was one of those. He believed that there was nothing good that could come from allowing this book and the book of James to remain in the, in the canon of Scripture. I don't know if that's quite true about the book of James. I, I think that's overstated. Okay. Yeah, that, that's kind of a myth. All right. I won't go further into it at this time. Yeah. Okay. Now, when we consider the Song of Songs, where do we find it? If we turn to Song of Songs, chapter 5, 
We're going to start with verse 2. I sleep, but my heart waketh. It is the voice of my beloved that knocketh, saying, Open to me, my sister, my love, my dove, my undefiled. For my head is filled with the dew, and my locks with the drops of the night. Now the beloved, the woman, says, I have put off my coat. How shall I put it on? I have washed my feet. How shall I defile them? Yeah. So the, so the woman isn't the beloved, right? The beloved always refers to uh, uh, the man. Okay. And can you make it bigger, uh, Ron is asking. Okay. Uh, Just a moment. Zoom in. Should ask you to do that. Hold down your control key and you, know, you just hold down your control key and roll the wheel on your mouse. It's not working. Yeah, you have to click on the document. Click on the document. Hold down your control key on your keyboard and roll the wheel. Yeah. How's that? Okay. Good. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. So <clears throat> the beloved, the one that is outside the door. Christ. Is Christ. The so one Christ that is at the door of the heart. He's knocking. It's an invitation parallel to Revelation chapter three. Okay, but is this is this also not a parallel to the parable of the ten virgins? No. Well, I mean, the, the church is asleep, isn't it? Yeah. So she she's asleep, but there's more to it when you look at the whole the whole book. Okay. So. It's just kind of, this is a book that I've studied in detail, so you have to sort of forgive me for commenting. <laughs> no, you're fine. I look forward to everyone's comments. Because I did a scripture song album from the Song of Solomon. Okay. So so one of the interesting things about this book is that, that Solomon is, uh, he's actually the woman. Because her name, Shulamit, just means, it's just the feminine form of the name Solomon. Okay. So Solomon is, and, and she's not attractive. There's nothing attractive about her. Um, so this is about God's unconditional love to Solomon. And he's doing it in the style of, of the poetry of the day. Right. Um, so in some ways you could almost say it's satire, right? But you know, that, that might be a bit controversial. Um, because it is also prophetic as well. Okay. And um, so uh, the beloved, of course, is, is Christ. And and there's some derogatory statements in, or contrasting statements regarding Solomon, because it does mention Solomon in the book, and how the contrast between Solomon's sort of weddings and things like that compared to, uh, you know, that's all show, and then this true love that, the beloved has for the Shulamit, right? So anyway, she's um, so she's asleep and she hears a knock on the door and then she uh, goes to the door, but her beloved is gone, right? By the time she gets to the door, it's what happens in this this uh, narrative. Right. She doesn't want to have to get out of her bed. I don't know if that's that's quite true. Um, she's she's just kind of startled because um, she does actually go go to the door. Yes, right? so she's Ap- drawn. So, so there's an apprehension about it, like it's I'm asleep in bed and I hear this knocking, and then I hear the voice of my beloved calling me, and and my heart is moved for him. So I I rose up to open the door. So she does do that. And, um, but when she gets there, he had withdrawn himself and was gone. And then, uh, so part of the thing about the song of Solomon is that it's, it's written in a chiastic structure. So previous to this is the wedding and everything up to the wedding is all positive. And then after the wedding, you're going to have the same stories or same illustrations, but they're all going to be negative. So it has this positive thing going up to the wedding. And then after the wedding, you're going to have uh, this sort of mirror or chiasm uh, going to the end of the book. 
uh, reflecting negative things of all the stuff that's positive in the beginning of the book. All right. So it's, 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 it's very interesting, actually. So when we have these negative items, these negative representations, mm-hmm. don't we also see this when we're looking at the seven churches in Revelation? Right. So, so in the, there's a, a, um, a commendation and a rebuke, except for Philadelphia, there's no rebuke. And they're also done in, in, um, there's some things there in a chiastic structure in the message to the seven churches, because when you look at Revelation, uh, chapter two, and it'll say, um, where is it here? He that hath an ear, let him hear what the spirit saith unto the churches to him that overcometh, right? And when you get, Further, um, it's going to have that him that overcometh when you get to the fourth church first, and then him that hath an ear, let him hear. And then from then on, it's always going to have him that hath an ear, let him hear. So, so there's kind of a chiastic structure dealing with just the order of the, uh, the promise to those that overcome and then the call to, uh, to listen to what the spirit says unto the churches. So these chiastic structures tell us something. Okay. So she's asked the question, I put off my coat. How shall I put it on? I have washed my feet. How shall I defile them? My beloved put in his hand by the hole of the door and my bowels removed for him. I rose up to open to my beloved and my hands dropped with myrrh and my fingers with sweet smelling myrrh upon the handles of the lock. I opened to my beloved, but my beloved had withdrawn himself and was gone. My soul failed when he spake. I sought him, but I could not find him. I called him, but he gave no answer. The watchmen that went about the city found me. They smote me. They wounded me. The keepers of the walls took away my veil from me. I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, if you find my beloved, that you tell him, I am sick of love. Now, here, Christ is being shown to have knocked at the door. Now, when we're, when we're using this reference and we're comparing it back with Revelation 3.20, I believe it gives weight as to why this book should have remained in Scripture. But let's also look at some other portions of this book. Song of Songs 6.10. Who is she that looketh forth as the morning, fair as the moon, clear as the sun, and terrible as an army with banners. Now, who wrote the Song of Songs? Well, Solomon did. Okay, now who was Solomon? Oh, he's the the last king of the United Kingdom. Okay. He's David's son, right? Mm -hmm. Now, when we look at this passage, who is the she, and why is she as fair as the moon? The she is the church. Okay. But why is it important that she be as fair as the moon? Why is it important that she be as clear as the sun and terrible as an army with banners? I want you to consider something. If we were to look at Song of Solomon 6.10, let's consider this. Verse 6.10. Who is she? And we're saying that this is the church. But why is it important for us to say that she is as fair as the moon? The Hebrew word here, Hebrew 3842. Would it be because it would be reflecting the light? It does reflect the light, brother. I agree with you. But if we look at this word that is selected and translated as the moon, Hebrew 3842, we only find this used three times within Scripture. The word moon, if we are looking using Cruden's concordance, is in multiple verses. Yeah. Why and, is- and, it, and it's a poetic way of referring to the moon, referring to its color, its whiteness. Yes. Properly, what is this word? Uh, well, it's Labana from Laban, which means uh, to be white. The white. Yeah. So... Here we are looking at this, that she looketh forth as the morning. She is as fair as the white. 
she is as clear as the sun, right? And is as terrible as an army with banners. And we see that this is in italics. Why? Army. It's not in the word. It's not in the text. Army is not in the text. Right. But banners is. Mm -hmm. We are to raise a flag. And the word clear actually means uh, beloved as the sun. Okay. And fair, of course, beautiful, fair, goodly. So when we're going through this, we're looking at this where we have as fair as the white. And we have this terrible banner that is being raised. How many banners are raised at this time in Earth's history? How many classes of people do we find at this time in Earth's history? We find two. We find the loads, two. The lords and the devils. We have these two banners. One is the black banner of the great apostate, and the other is the blood-stained banner of Prince Emmanuel. Right? Yes. So when we go through here, we find that this Libana, however you pronounce it, where we're talking the white of the moon, is used once by Solomon and twice by Isaiah. Now, Isaiah was part of the royal family of David, was he not? Um, how, how did we determine that he was part of the royal family of David? Was that certain or not certain? Where, where did we get that idea? I believe that came from Mrs. White. Yeah, so I'm trying to remember. Yeah. Uh, no, hang on. That's a different... Uh... Oh, yeah. Isaiah also was of the royal line of David. Also of the royal line of David was a shepherd boy. Okay, yeah. So that's where we get it from. Okay. So Isaiah was a prophet. Mm -hmm. Was David a prophet? And could we say that Solomon was also a prophet? Well, it depends what you mean by prophet. I mean, they didn't have office, office of a prophet, but because um, both of them were kings, but definitely they... They spoke prophetically. So if, if you're going to use that to define a prophet, then they were prophets. I mean, anybody who wrote scripture technically in some ways is a prophet, even, even Nebuchadnezzar. Exactly. Right. It doesn't mean he had the office of a prophet. So here we have this Hebrew word. Hebrew 3842. The white. Now, we want this noted that this is combined with the statement terrible with banners, since army and army is in italics. It is one of those italicized phrases, though, that Mrs. White did not give instructions about, as she did with the word sacrifice that was applied with the word daily and Daniel. So I found it quite striking. When Ellen harmed James White, she took the married night, but had Harmon, which is an is an old German phrase for a man or soldier. Now here, our next witness, Isaiah twenty four twenty three. Then the moon shall be confounded, and the sun ashamed. When the Lord of hosts shall reign in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem before his ancients gloriously. What can we take from this? I looked at it because this moon is the white. So the white shall be pale or ashamed. And if the white is ashamed and the sun is ashamed, why would this be? When we look at the Strong's numbers for these words, confounded, sun, and ashamed, that are used in this passage, we find that these three phrases total to 6148, or the digits for 1846, the time when Ellen Harmon marries James White, and they begin to accept the Sabbath. These are the two covenant relationships that are being abandoned today by the world. Is this not enough to make anyone ashamed? Yep. Okay, now we go to Isaiah 30, verse 26. 
Moreover, the light of the moon shall be as the light of the sun, and the light of the sun shall be sevenfold, as the light of seven days. In the day that the Lord bindeth up the breach of his people and healeth the stroke of their wound. What can we see from this passage? Well, you have the repair of the breach. Um, you have the moon, which will be as the light of the sun. You have the sevenfold, and you have the seven days. Now, the sevenfold is a dual ab- adverb of Hebrew 7651, which is used after this, right? Yeah, seven six five one is is the number seven, or Shiva. There's, yeah, but it, yeah, in English though we had just translated as seven. Okay, right. Now we've come to note that whenever there is a doublet, is this is this a doublet? Sevenfold to seven days. Are these just two two separate statements, or are these to be taken together? All right. <laughs> Now, let's consider this. As we were talking at the very beginning of the meeting, as it was being pointed out in the chat, here we have the commendation to Laodicea. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eye salve that, they, that thou may see. So here we are being told by Christ to buy of me gold tried in the fire. Could we say that at this time the writings of Mrs. White have been being tried in the fire? Yeah, I would say so. Being tried in the fire right now, too. Exactly. Now, second, we are to purchase raiment. We are to obtain the character, which is to be white. Can we obtain character from any other than Christ? And obtain character from the world. <laughs> okay. But will that, will that character that we obtain from the world gain us admittance to the wedding? Certainly not. We'll be locked out. Locked out, thrown out, however we want to look at it. Now, did Ellen white obtain this character yeah she would have had to um oh you mean the world no, of the, char- the character of christ oh yeah otherwise you'd never be a prophet did william miller obtain this character i would say he did well here again to some degree well let, let's be honest what does mrs white say currently is occurring at the grave of William Miller. So about the angels. That the angels of God are watching over the very dust of his sleeping servant. Yeah. Are the angels of God currently watching over the dust of Thomas Paine? I would say no. (laughs) So of these, William Miller or Thomas Paine, which will have admittance to the wedding. Would it not be? Excuse me? Yeah, it'd be uh, Miller, Miller, of course. Okay. Now, when we're preparing to walk out in the dark, what do we need? Don't we need a bright and shining light? We need a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Exactly. Both. Isn't this the definition that we read of Ellen? Yeah. <clears throat> now, to what church was Ellen White prophet? Was she the prophet to Sardis? Was she the prophet to Philadelphia? Philadelphia. Yeah, Philadelphia. So Laodicea too, somewhat. I was. Yeah, she, she wasn't the prophet to Philadelphia. She's the prophet to Laodicea. Laodicea. I was thinking, yeah. In all these ways, all of these warnings. Of all these things we're to acquire, we find these elements in the very name of Ellen Gould White. So here we are. We have John the Beloved, Isaiah, and Solomon are all together describing one prophet. 
they are all looking forward to the time in which Ellen White is to give her message to a church in apostasy. Now, is this, I mean, this, this little study, this little conversation, does this give us elements so that we may fully and more clearly understand just how much of a prophet Ellen White truly was? I mean, I've had, I've had so many people within the Adventist church that claim her just to be a lesser light. And as the lesser light, we don't need to listen to what she's had to say. We saw this element established by Uriah Smith when he was making the statement that when Ellen White had a public vision, then that was from God. But when she gave her testimonies, that was just her opinion. That's what, and, a, lot of leader, that's what a lot of leadership believe, don't they? Exactly. Is that what we're to believe today? Believe the prophets and you'll prosper. Exactly. Directs us. She directs us what we should study in the last days, too. And people are not listening to that. They really don't want to listen to that, do they? No, it don't appear, don't appear that way. And yes, I agree in the chat that the lesser light reflects the sun. How can you reflect the greater light if you don't observe the greater light? If you're not willing to accept the greater light. As I have been looking and studying through this in the book of Zechariah, there's quite a bit that we have yet to address, quite a bit that we have yet to see. Okay, the comment is made in the chat. If Ellen White is regarded as a dispensable lesser light, how much more inferior are the elders and pastors that we observe today? Are we to accept the pronouncements of popes in and as of our rule of faith? Are we to take the word of man as our yardstick so that we may measure our faith? What is to be our rule, our guiding light in all things? When William Miller had his second dream, and the casket in which these jewels and coins were destroyed. What happened with him in this, in this dream? Did he not weep? Then he is weeping and the dirt brush man comes in and he replaces that casket with one that is more glorious, right? Now the comment had been made in the past by others that when this casket was replaced it was larger and more glorious than the former and the numbers that were used would help us to understand that this was not just scripture but was scripture plus spirit of prophecy can we choose to follow the words of the general conference president gi butler that some of the bible is inspired and some of it is not Certainly not. Can we choose to follow the words of those that would be pastors that say Ellen White's writings have no place in the Adventist church today? No, they're certainly not. So as we continue in our study this next week, as we look further into Zechariah 5 and prepare to go further in this study, in this supposedly minor prophet, we're going to need to understand that what is written here is written directly for our admonition today, for our understanding and for our guidance, that we would set this aside at our very peril. Any other thoughts or comments about what we have covered today? Any questions? Okay, shall we then close with prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for your long bearing with us, for sending us those to give us warnings, to help us to understand more clearly that which you have provided in eras past. Be with each one today. Guide us, Father. Show us that which you would have us to understand. 
Forgive us of our sins. Help us now. Direct us in the path that we need to walk so that we may draw closer to you. I thank you for each that have participated today. I thank you for those that will view this later and ask you now, Father, that you watch over us throughout this Sabbath day. For this, we thank you. For this, we praise you. Now and always, in Jesus' name, amen.